These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. So the first thing I put, um, that I think you stressed a lot was numbering the carbons. Did like, I stress that? Yeah, yeah, I probably did. Yeah. Excellent. So, That's right. I, I was going to start with that when I didn't know what to start with just to break up my being really nervous and scared about where to go. Next. Yeah, absolutely. So that's an excellent thing to make a note of. We've talked about how that should be your default. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about how most people will only number as a last resort. If that, well, right. no, that should be your default. Part of the word default also means, though, that every once in a while there might be a problem where numbering is not appropriate. Maybe because the problem is so easy, or more likely that there just might be some reason where the numbering is, is, uh, isn't working for you. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying that you got to number 100% of the time, but it should be your default. Okay. There, you should only, the only time when you shouldn't be numbering is if you, if you have like a good reason not to. Whereas, like I say, unfortunately, most students will only number if they have a good reason. Well, no, um, it, it should be the other way around. So okay. that's good. Um, and then I was watching one of your videos today, and it, it, you said something funny that said, if you get the arrows incorrectly, a five-year-old could finish the problem. I thought that was funny. Yeah, the arrows correctly. Correctly, yeah. Right. Because so I so my next step was to just look at what you said needs to be formed and needs to be broken, um, right. In order to get the reaction that I that I need, I guess. Yeah. So that my arrows will be going the right direction. And right. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. So so one thing I was trying to point out there, some, something that um, I feel a lot of students don't understand is, like I said, that the arrows once you have the correct arrows, there shouldn't be any guesswork right. about what the product is. The arrows tell you exactly what to do. And unfortunately, most students don't really follow the directions of the arrows. Instead, they just kind of, I think, they write down something that feels, feels good, or they write down something that seems similar to a previous problem. When they, what they should be doing is looking at the first arrow and asking, what precise changes does this arrow tell me to make? And then looking at the next arrow and asking, what precise changes does this arrow tell me to make? And the See, arrows, yeah. arrows on electrons, not atoms. That's right. The arrows tell you how the electrons are moving. That's right. So don't write down what feels good. Instead, consciously ask yourself, what exactly does this arrow tell me to do? And then wh how should you be thinking about that? Um, so there's two main questions you should ask yourself. First of all, remember that each arrow either tells you to form a bond, to break a bond, or both. So that's one of the best ways to think about it. You should ask, which bond does this tell me to break, or which bond does this tell me to form, or, or both? And you want to be as specific as possible. But one thing I tried to encourage you to do during the class is don't say, oh, I'm forming a bond between that molecule and that molecule. Instead, say, I'm forming a bond between carbon-6 and the oxygen. You know, because you want to be as specific as possible about the exact atoms that you're forming the bond between. Um, the, the last thing you want to do is say, I'm going to form a bond between that and it. People tend to use pronouns much too much in their head. Uh, instead, you want to be very specific. I'm forming a bond between this bromine and carbon number four, say. And that's one reason why you're putting in the numbers. So you can be very specific about which atoms are participating in each arrow. So ask yourself exactly which bond the arrow tells you to form or to break. And like you said, that's the right way to think about it. The wrong way is to think that the arrow tells you, a lot of people look in the arrow and they think this says, oh, this means to move the bromine over there, or this means to move the carbon over there. No, the arrows don't tell you how to move the atoms. It, you should not think of the arrows as telling you how to move atoms. Instead, you should think of it as telling you which bonds to form or which bonds to break or both. And then they tell you something else that's even more important. Every step of every mechanism, you're going to change two charges. Uh, and so you should consciously ask yourself, what are the two charges that I changed here? Yeah. Now, sometimes the charge ends up neutral, and then a lot of people just get it right by accident without thinking about it. But you don't want to be getting things right by accident. You want to be getting them right because you thought about it. So after every step of every mechanism, you should consciously ask yourself, what were the two charges that I had to change at the initial tail and at the final head? Um, and that way, um, and, uh, that way, even if the uh, charge doesn't end up neutral, you'll get the right charge. Again, unfortunately, most people just kind of write down charges that feel good, or they're only put in a charge if they remember seeing a charge on previous reaction that's similar. Um, but you, sh you shouldn't have to do guesswork like that. Instead, you should just change two charges at the initial tail and the final head, and that tells you exactly what the charges should be. So the arrows really do give you a lot of information. So one big lesson about the arrows is the arrows take out all the guesswork. They tell you exactly what to do. However, they only do that, of course, if you put the right arrows in in the first place. And that's what should be the hard part. 
the hard part should be getting the right arrows in the first place. And for that, that's something a five-year-old can't do. Right, right. The five-year-old should be able to interpret the arrows once they're there, but um, I don't know, you've got to be a seven or eight-year-old before you can figure out what arrows to put in in the first place. Right. And for that, there are a bunch of tricks and rules of thumb, but it also takes some judgment. And we talked about a lot of the important things. Remember that things that are negative tend to go at tails, and things that are positive tend to go at heads. Although we saw that there's some exceptions there. Sometimes something that's positive, um, well, so we saw that things that are negative tend to be nucleophiles and bases, and things that are, um, and go at, ta at tails of arrows, and electrophiles and leaving groups tend to go at heads of arrows. Uh, so those are uh, important things to look for. So one big thing is look for the formal charges. And if there aren't any formal charges, maybe look for partial charges that yeah, will help you that determine that. that. Yeah, so those, those are very charges. helpful for determining where the arrows go. And part of that is, even if you can only figure out half of an arrow, it's very useful. So even if you can only figure out where the tail of the arrow goes, well, go ahead and put in the tail, and then maybe that'll help you to see where the head goes. Or even if you only know where the head goes, put in the head, and maybe that'll help you to put in the tail. And even if you never figure out where to put the other half of the arrow, well, at least you should get some partial credit, because the instructor can see that you knew where to put part of the arrow. So yeah, the hard part is figuring out what arrows to put in the first place. That, that is hard, but there are some good techniques, like especially looking for the charges and the other things that we've talked about that tell you who the nucleophiles and who the electrophiles are. <clears throat> and then I have just to remember that the leaving group leaves and takes its electrons with it, goes along with the whole charge. Yep, yeah. that helps you to understand uh, what it means to be a, a leaving group, that's right. And then um, the strong acids, um, sulfuric acid, HCl, HBr, and HI, mm -hmm. and you pretty much always donate a proton when you're dealing with that as first step. That's right. For default. That's right. Reason. In fact, this term, I think it's 100%. 100%. Okay. If you see any of those four strong acids that you just mentioned, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, or hydroiodic, you know for sure what the first step will be. The first step is that the strong acid will give its proton to somebody. Okay. And all you have to do is figure out who should take that proton. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then my last thing was to always check for stereochemistry and rearrangement, because I missed those things. Okay. Those are two different things, but that's right. good. So, um, the, the way that we put that is, you should always ask whether your, pro your new product or intermediate has any new stereocenters. You should ask, am I forming a stereocenter? And if you're forming a stereocenter, then you have to think about the stereochemistry. Um, so one thing to do is um, ask if I'm forming a stereocenter, and then ask what the stereochemistry which should be. That means, should I, put the, should I put the thing on the wedge? Or should I put the thing on the dash? Or maybe is there a mixture where I need one mixture with the wedge and one with the dash, if you're making two products? So yeah, that's good to look for the um, the stereo um, products. Stereo um, center, it's attached to four different groups. It's the chiral, a chiral. That's right. Okay. So it's certainly crucial um, that it be very easy to quickly identify whether a carbon is a stereo center. Okay. So yeah, a chiral carbon is the same thing as a stereo center. It's also called an asymmetric carbon. It's a carbon attached to four different groups, and that's when you have to be careful to, with the wedges and the dashes. And there's another type of stereochemistry too that's even harder to remember, which is cis and trans. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're forming a double bond, you have to ask, do I need to set up the cis, or do I need to set it up trans, or, or both, or does it not matter? So that's another type of stereochemistry that's harder to think of because it doesn't involve the wedges and the dashes. These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher dot com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box thank you